for those that don't know me, I'm Derek Sterko. I've been Deputy Minister of Agriculture for about four years now. It's my great pleasure to welcome here. For all of you who are interested, here's my PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> um, so first off, um, the context for this for me is um, about a year and a half ago, we worked with the entire agriculture, agri-foods industry. So for the Ministry of Agriculture, that means everything from primary production, food processing, the seafood and agriculture sector, wineries, breweries, and so forth, all the sales and distribution outlets, et cetera, to produce a single growth plan for the industry. As part of that work with that entire sort of advisory committee comprised of all those sectors, we created a single growth plan, a single uh, five-year plan, with a very ambitious target of 43% growth in the industry over about a nine or 10-year period. I can let you know we're well on the way to achieving that, although there's still some ways to go. Uh, we have, as that um, framework for that plan, increasing production, competitiveness, and growing markets. So three pretty broad themes, but I can let you know that agritech and technology form really important parts of all three of those streams, as I'm sure you can imagine. Uh, we have a very active and aggressive agritech industry in this province, as you've seen over the last day and a half, and if you're here last year, a very active technology sector in this province, with agritech as a very important growing piece. And uh, so for the ministry, this has become a really important piece of our work. As Celine has mentioned, we've tried to really uh, embrace the technology and make it part of our life. And, uh, but my primary purpose here, after that bit of context, is to introduce the sort of host of our session, uh, Dr. Ricky Yada, who's chair of the Faculty of Land and Food Systems at the University of British Columbia. And if we have time to fill after, I think Ricky's gonna do a song for us, so. <laughs> Ricky. As my father would say, no pressure. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Derek. Uh, first of all, I think we win the prize for the longest session title. Holy crow. You know, if I read that, we'd use up the entire session. But, you know, it's a pleasure for me to be able to host you here today. This is a wonderful um, event so that we can talk about challenges and opportunities. And we, ha as Celine has indicated, we have a wonderful cadre of speakers who have lived the lives of talking about some of the challenges and opportunities and some of their successes. As the title indicates, we're talking about transformation. We're talking about diversification, but we're also talking about technology and technology to ramp us up. You know, one of the things that I think British Columbia is known for is the wonderful agricultural commodities that we have. But I think we've been ingrained in a sense of commodity selling rather than value added. And this is where some of these speakers will talk about their experiences as they uh, moved along that continuum from commodity to value add. Um, before we get into the session, uh, I just wanted to um, talk about a editorial that came out yesterday in the Globe and Mail. And this is by Dominic Barton, who was the author of that report that Minister Morneau charged the Advisory Council with doing. And it's called, How Canada Can Become a Global Food Production Powerhouse. And so um, let me just read you some excerpts from that editorial. It says, clearly Canada agri-food sector is well positioned, so what's missing? And then it goes on to say, despite our strength, Canada ranks fifth globally in agricultural exports, only 11th in uh, processed food product exports, behind far smaller countries such as Holland and behind less economically advantaged countries such as Brazil. Few of our food companies achieve world scale and only 50% of our agricultural production is processed here. Increasing our global market share of ag food exports could add tens of billions of dollars to our economy. I thought that was very telling. The other paragraph that I'm gonna read from is uh, a statement that they make is, food issues fall under the domain of several departments which could be better coordinated, for instance, to reconcile health and economic policy priorities. I think we're seeing a transformation of how food is viewed these days. Food can be that preventative mechanism for healthcare. Instead of taking a pill or surgery, I think if we eat right, then we could actually reduce a lot of our healthcare costs. And finally, it says, 
Now, more than ever, Canada needs to be clear about how it can develop an economic policy that is clearly in its national best interest. This starts by having a bold vision about what we can accomplish. Canada's agri-food sector could become the trusted global leader in safe, nutritious, and sustainable food for the 21st century. Ladies and gentlemen, I think the speakers that you'll hear this afternoon are addressing that topic exactly. So without further ado, let me first of all introduce uh, Dave Smarden. And Dave's going to be talking about why Agritech. And I have had the fortune of knowing Dave for about 15, 20 years. And Dave's with BioEnterprise. And I remember, Dave, when you were a two-person operation. It was you and a receptionist. And boy, have you grown. So Dave, without further ado, please come up. So I've been tasked with trying to paint a picture for you of, uh, of Agritech leading into some of the other speakers. And I would assume here that most of the people in the audience have some skin in the game in some way in the agricultural community, whether you're with government, research community, entrepreneurs, producers, and so on. But the, the, I always ask the question, you know, where has the term ag tech come from and, and, and why is agritech becoming such a dominant area of interest? Why is the media focusing on it now? When you go into the exhibit space here, you know, the, what's the first thing you see? You see the big greenhouses and they're full of agricultural entrepreneurs. If you go back a few years, you would never have gone to a high tech conference and seen a bunch of greenhouses sitting in the middle of the, of the, of the exhibit floor. So things have really changed a lot. At BioEnterprise, we have seen about 2,000 startup companies in the agri-tech space. So this is not something that is new. It's been going on for a while. But what we've seen in the media has taken this to another level. So uh, let's see if I have this right. Oh, hit the green button, the biggest one, of course. Um, so what is agriculture technology? Agritech, right? You'll see all kinds of different definitions of it. For us, these are the three components. And that, yes, there is traditional agriculture in here. There's commodity organizations and commodity innovations that we see coming out, and, and we're always interested in those. But as you look up and down the value chain, how can we change, dramatically change, the way that we are processing food, growing food, harvesting food? What are the inputs that are going to be needed and then when you go into, into areas like food and food processing, what kind of packaging do we need? You know, you, you, look at, you look at some of the packaging that's on the shelf now and you scratch your head. Why is so much packaging needed? And, wha and why is there so much waste in the packaging? What kind of packaging is needed to ship salmon from Norway into North America? Um, what kind of processing can we get involved in that reduces the amount of water that we use? So there's a whole lot of areas here that, that fall into agriculture and agricultural technology that are well beyond anything that traditional ag looked at, right? So when you look at what the media has focused on, the boxes in the light blue are areas that everybody talks about. And that's part of why we're all here today, because we, we have drank this Kool-Aid, and it's, it's the proper Kool-Aid to drink. So you look at population growth. Let's talk about that just for a second. Everybody says we're going to be a 9 billion population by 2050. And those numbers go from 9 to 9.2, 9.6. Nobody really knows, of course. And it's not just about the population. It's about the dynamics that happen when you have that many people. So we're 7 billion now, give or take, right? When you look at the population of India, anybody have an idea as to how big the middle class of India is today? It's 560 million people, just the middle class. And when you look at India, China, Malaysia, Africa, the population there is moving from rural populations to the cities. The cities are getting dramatically bigger. When that happens, the eating changes, the eating habits change. The types of protein they eat change. When they get, when they get to the cities and they have jobs and they and their children become educated, they want to eat like who? They want to eat like Westerners. They want to eat steak. They want to eat pork. They want to eat salmon. Right? They no longer want to live off of the protein that comes from lentils. And here we are in North America thinking, maybe we should be eating more lentils. Right? It's, a, it's, it's a complete uh, uh, dichotomy. So, um, so the, the population one is, is an interesting one. 
Um, and it's, it's further complicated by the fact that the arable land that we have, the productivity of that land is decreasing. We've hit a benchmark. We're taking the nutrients out of the land and we're having a tough time figuring out how to continue to use that land year over year over year. So as the population grows, the current arable land, the productivity is shrinking. Yes, we're gonna have more land in Africa, that's great. But when it's a zero sum game at the end of the day. And the problem with Africa is there's no infrastructure in Africa. How do you get your product to market? There aren't, there aren't the freeways, there aren't the train systems. And so we have a number of dilemmas here, all very, very much linked together. And Ricky mentioned the, the health, you know, eating for health uh, and, and changing our whole diets. We're also looking at reducing our, um, our reliance on petroleum-based products. So you start to see parts of agriculture, the use of oils in paint thinners, the use of oils in bioplastics, and the big automobile companies and the airline companies are investing heavily in these, in these areas. So you could go on for a long time. On the, on the right-hand side there is what we define as a short list of agricultural technologies. And the key that I see here is that agriculture and the technologies that come out of agriculture could all have a significant impact on the left-hand side. So from a global impact standpoint, you know, how big is agriculture? And these are just some, some facts that we, that we threw together. We know that 70% of the world's fresh water is used to support agriculture. That's a lot. It's way more than we should be using. And that, that doesn't include food processing. Okay, 30% of the world's land use is used for agriculture, that makes sense. One in three people on the planet work in the agricultural industry. That's a bill surprise as well. And then you have 12% uh, of, uh, I can't read my own, my own stuff here. Oh, right, 12% of the land is used for crop production. Now there's, there's something I wanted to mention here um, that I pulled out the other day. And I know we, we've talked about this in the past, but when you start to look at, um, the, the demand for protein. And if you, if you buy into all of the kind of statistics that we're talking about, people moving from rural to, to cities and so on, and, and people wanting to eat steak, um, it takes 2,500 gallons of water. This is in the U.S., because not everybody's the same. It takes 2,500 gallons of water to produce one pound of beef. It takes 12 pounds of grain. The energy consumed to support this is one gallon of gas, and, uh, and all of this, oh, and, and, and 35 pounds of topsoil. So this is what the scientists have put together as, as what does it cost to produce one pound of beef? Does that sound efficient to you? It sure doesn't to me. And when we have a popul what could be a population crisis and the need to feed nine to 10 billion people, to put all that effort into feeding a cow or a beef cow to produce one, one pound of ground beef or steak doesn't make a lot of sense. So that's why you're starting to see organizations, I think there's five companies around the world now that are producing protein, um, basically steak in Petri dishes, right? And we, we've, we've heard about this on places like 60 Minutes and so on, but, but it is actually happening. The fact that it costs $300,000 for a small amount of steak, you know, it's always expensive when they first come out, right? So um, this is a list of, of the various things that we are running into which are creating this perfect storm. And I think it's a very big reason as to why we're all in the room together here trying to find ways to solve these various problems. Um, what we are seeing nowadays is it, it's not just about you know, making a new yogurt and putting vitamin C and vitamin B12 and stuff into that, into that yogurt. It's about changing, dramatically changing the way we do things and, and thinking out of the box. And so that's what we're hoping to, f to find at conferences like this. When we walk into the greenhouse here locally um, in the exhibit center, there are some very creative minds at play in there. And we know that they're gonna be successful down the road. So um, this is the last slide, I believe, and it's the one that has, is the most impactful. When you talk about how much food we're going to need in 2050, it's the dark area there. And we will need to create more food in that one year than we have had to do for the history of the world. Now, you have to think about that for a minute, you know. How much food do we have to create? 
And we've been around for how long? 10,000, 25,000 years? And we're going to have to create more food than that entire period of time. So how are we going to do it? Well, the only way you're going to do it is through innovation. We have to be highly innovative to increase the productivity and to find new ways of feeding the planet. I'll stop there. Thanks very much. My name is Karin. This is Dr. Annette Rozek. She's our Chief Scientific Officer. Um, and uh, we, and Terramera um, is, is focused really on one key question. How do we use technology to unlock the power of nature and natural materials so we can live healthy, make clean food affordable, and feed the world? So how do we do that? One of the key paradigms in, in agriculture is that the, the dichotomy between the use of, of pesticides and the, and the necessity of pesticides and the need to increase, as, as Dave and Ricky were talking about, the need to increase food production and protect against the loss of food production. And one of the key paradigms um, that has occurred over the last 80 years is uh, since the development of synthetic pesticides is their importance to protecting our homes, to protecting um, our crops from loss. And, um, and we've had to accept this idea that there is an acceptable level of toxicity that we need to, to have and to accept, uh, otherwise there won't be enough food to eat. And the problem is, you know, many plants and, and trees have actually have evolved over 35 million years. Some of the most so sophisticated methods of being able to protect themselves naturally from pests and disease, and from stresses. But the biological um, materials, partly due to the amount IP law and the amount of innovation that has gone into the, the development of synthetic, small molecule synthetics versus biologicals has been low. So the biologicals that have been on the market have a number of problems. Not only are they expensive, they're hard to scale, they're difficult to, to store, are often challenge, challenging to use. And the, the biggest pro part of it is that they, the, the products that are available really are not as effective at controlling the diseases and the pests uh, that occur in, in, uh, in crops as the synthetic chemicals are. We believe that, that for every problem that nature, nature delivers, nature has a solution. Um, and what we look at is some of the, is, is some of the uh, um, planted trees that have evolved some very sophisticated methods, um, like neem. This is a, a neem tree from South Asia. And we look at how we can harness the power of those natural defenses for large-scale commercial uses. So Terramero was founded in 2010 when, uh, while I was at, at UBC uh, uh, to really understand and deconstruct why many of these biological materials weren't working as well as their synthetic uh, 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 cousins. And we really broke it down. So, our focus was these materials work well in the plant of origin. They oftentimes work well in, the lab, in a lab situation, but why are they not working when, they, when we scale them? And our focus was that, that if we can apply innovation and technology to get them to work, we can develop safer and even more effective and economical replacements to some of the conventional chemical pesticides and fertilizers we're using today. And we broke that down to really three key things, the uh, characterization of the compounds, stability, and delivery of them. And we found that we can actually do this uh, with a molecular delivery technology that allows large molecules to perform, the biologicals to perform. Um, we call it Inspirium. And Annette is going to tell us what that exactly means. So biological active ingredients are really difficult to work with. They are complex heterogeneous mixtures that contain large molecules that are uh, unable and often to effectively penetrate into a target organism. And so the active molecules cannot penetrate the cell membrane and cannot reach inside to bind to their target proteins. At Terramera, we've recognized that that's the reason for this problem that we're having with uh, natural products. And so we went and developed Inspirum technology, which delivers active ingredients into target cells. And that makes natural products dramatically more active. So how does it work? Conventional formulations are blocked very effectively by cells. The molecules hit the outside of the cell, but they cannot interact with the cell membrane, and so they remain outside. 
With Inspirium technology, we formulate active ingredients so that they can interact with the cell membrane, open up the cell, diffuse inside, and unfold their activity inside the cell. Here, they actually now reach the effective concentrations that are necessary for target protein binding. Um, and now finally, they can uh, achieve the uh, full uh, potentiality that natural compounds really have. So for product applications, uh, Inspirum is formulated with active ingredients and uh, sprayed on plants or on the soil around the plants. And uh, our technology is uh, agnostic to the active ingredients, so we can use different ones. We can uh, create uh, various products, such as uh, fungicides, insecticides, nematicides, and also plant nutrition products, which combined uh, provide complete solutions for the uh, uh, protection and for the nourishment of the plant. Botrytis is one of the most uh, important food rot pathogens that we encounter in the world. You all uh, have been uh, uh, dealing with, I think, with this white fuzz on the strawberries at one time or another. With the natural plant extract, neem oil, um, we can inhibit uh, botrytis growth uh, by about 30%. With Inspirium technology, we can take that activity all the way up to 100% pathogen control. Now, that would be impressive if it was done with a chemical pesticide. But to achieve that with the natural product, that's a game changer. Our lab-based results extend to a wide range of pathogens, and they translate really well into the field. Um, here shown some results on uh, um, powdery mildew on table grapes. We achieve greater than 98% disease control, which is better than the uh, uh, conventional chemical grower standard, um, and which results in a 70% increase in yield over that standard. And what we also see is um, an increase, um, an improvement in the color of the grapes, and also in the speed of maturation. And these are some of the additional benefits that you can only realize when you work with natural products. Higher quality uh, translates into more money in the grower's pocket. Um, we can uh, improve the quality of table grapes from number one quality, to num from number two quality to number one quality, um, which fetches 50% higher price. And so our results show that we can double the grower's revenue and we can increase his profit uh, a staggering 15 times. So we're focused on, on developing technologies that allow growers to transition over to clean or organic farming te uh, methods and be profitable right away. Uh, if we are able to actually use biologicals in this way, we can actually tran we can transform how, how agriculture is done and pest control is done. And, and we see that not just in pest control, but also in, and we're, we're looking more and more into the enhancement of uptake of fertilizers. You can see here, uh, in uh, this is a farmer's field in Georgia. These are peanuts, and you can see the difference between the, the control and the uh, uh, and and uh, and and the the treated uh, products, which are uh, actually yielded over 20% increase in yield, which to the grower is an over 70% increase in profit, and that's without selling them as organic. So. Um, and, and we can use this technology as well, not just for crops and farmers, but also for, to protect public health. Um, we have, uh, by being able to penetrate into uh, public health uh, problems and pests like uh, bed bugs and dust mites, we've actually developed a product which is on sale in the US. It's actually the only product that's known that's 100% effective in controlling uh, dust mites, bed bugs, and their eggs. And in, in fact, actually, it's the only product that the US EPA has ever allowed a claim that says it's 100% effective. Um, uh, and they've said, uh, you know, sometimes you see 99%, 99.9, but et cetera, the data supported it, and so they've allowed it. And that's uh, 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 approved in, uh, across the US. Uh, it has been for a couple of years, and it's uh, uh, on, on sale for, for uh, uh, at a number of major chains. So. Replacing um, chemical pesticides and fertilizers with, with organic options are, is not only beneficial for uh, our health, we, can see, we actually are seeing yield improvements, but it has a major impact on, on the climate as well. Agriculture accounts for uh, about 25% of uh, greenhouse gases and changing to organic methods 
can actually make a major impact. So at the end of the day, we're, what we're focused on is developing technologies and using technologies to accelerate um, the use of, uh, of natural materials and get natural materials to perform better um, so we can live healthy, make clean food affordable, and, uh, and feed the world. If you have ideas, we, we invite you to think about that. We invite you to think about how you can use technologies of various sorts to be able to achieve that. And uh, we'd love your ideas. You can connect with us on the web, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, or find us afterwards. Thank you very much. So I, I just want to make clear that I thought it was a competition in terms of length of title. And so I, I wanted to make sure my title was longer than the, anyone else's. Um, we had great introductions today, and, and I have to, the, the painting of the global fi uh, food, um, some people call it food crisis, combined with population growth. Um, my presentation is going to focus on the efforts that we've been doing since 2012, trying to bring that down to a, a, a smaller scale that's around sustainable food production at a kind of a local level. Now, when I talk, I usually try to do things into a supply and a demand. And so my presentation today to you guys is going to be talking about the direction that the food is going. And I think you hinted it before is that um, as consumers, we're starting to see the link between our health outcomes and the food we eat. And so traditional food production systems, and it was highlighted in, in Africa or other countries, is so far removed from where we are in our health outcomes is that we're starting to see a lot of research in the health industry close that gap. So we're starting to see that if you have, early, because of genetics, if you're predisposed to Alzheimer's, then you should start eating more of these foods. If you have a predisposition to um, different kind of diseases, whether it's cancer, we're starting to see that evidence come out of our healthcare system. So what we do at Myera Group is that we actually say that before we can start on a food system play, we're not part of the agricultural supply chain. We're actually part of the health supply chain. And so in this diagram here, we start out with nutritional mapping. And so the first thing that we do is we go into a community, and we've been working with some First Nations communities in Manitoba. I'm a proud mentee from Manitoba. So we have a lot of issues in northern Manitoba where food availability and food security is a big issue because only if it can't survive a flight in minus 40, which a lot of you guys can't understand, um, <laughs> that limits your food choices, let me tell you. So we actually start out with um, what are the top health priorities. That's where our starting point is. And so in 80% of the First Nations in, in Canada have type 2 diabetes, and 80% of them are going to lose their eyesight because of that. So I'm just giving an example of one of the things that we're starting with. So we actually then come up with a health profile. That then gives us, in that middle there, what you guys might hear, and people will talk about food, functional food, nutraceuticals, and pharmaceuticals. In order to increase your health and your health outcomes, those are your choices. Now in northern Manitoba, because we don't have access to food and it's a generational issue, is that even if you do provide food, um, a lot of people don't know what to do with it. I had a really good example. In Manitoba, we, had something called, we have something called the Northern Stores. And so I was at a conference and the, the president was proud and he's just like, we solved some logistical problems and this, that, and the other thing. And he goes, the problem that we didn't anticipate is that no one in northern Manitoba had seen a yellow banana before. They all show up brown. So anyway, we had yellow bananas and everyone's just like, what is this? And so it just really illustrates the point that, you know, um, those are the types of progress we're experiencing. <laughs> so. In our system here, we know that food isn't going to be immediate. It's going to, we need to solve that problem, and it's going to happen over the next five to 10 years. So that means if we're going to address things like type 2 diabetes, we need to move to something like a nutraceutical, a pill. So we take that until we have more food choices for the population that we're looking at. Um, functional foods, I kind of skipped that. So one of the functional foods that we're working on is actually we provide some of our um, bioactives to a chicken, and then chicken has a magical egg. And if you eat this, you can jump over tall buildings and that kind of stuff. I'm just kidding. Um, but in our particular case, again, focusing on type 2 diabetes and vision loss, we've been doing animal studies at the University of Manitoba looking at adding different feeds to the ingredients um, that are organic that then can have a bioactive food. And so when we're grazing chickens up north, not only are they eating a great protein source, um, they're getting engaged in 
you know, local farming, but they also have now a functional food egg, which protects their eyes. So that's a functional food, and nutraceutical is the pill. So nutraceutical is a very specific bioactive that is targeted to an area of interest. So in what we have in our in my area group is we have production facilities. And so we start out with these health profiles, and then from there we actually form a production facility. So in this case, if we're working with a First Nation, we say, how many people is it that you want to feed, and what are the health outcomes that you would like to address, and we create that production facility. So what are our products? Well, I'd say our first product is health outcomes. Because if we can't see a measurable reduction in type 2 diabetes, I think we failed. So our products are on the bottom right corner. That's food, functional food, or nutraceuticals. And it's all in the context of health outcomes. So I put in kind of bubbles up there. You know, those are the buzzwords so in terms of personalized nutrition and personalized health. And, and I know in your agricultural facility, there's, first of all, departments and universities don't talk. So we're kind of really uh, betting here on, on a revolution in bureaucracy in the, in, the, in the academics departments because now you have the technology engineering lab talking with the health, out, you know, the population health facilities, and then you have that talking with ag. Um, and I, so I, I think that paradigm of collaboration needs to, to tighten um, because we all depend on you guys. So I'm going to switch to, so at the very bottom, these are the areas that we're focusing on in health. So in terms of diabetes, so that's vision loss for, for Aboriginal youth. And again, that's 80% of the population are at risk to losing 80% of their, 80 of those will lose their eyesight. Um, the other things that we're looking at very specifically is computer vision syndrome. Um, reduction in Alzheimer's disease, making sure that we have the right food for that, and the early childhood developmental disorder. So we've done a lot of work with FASD and, and the role of nutrition as a nutritional intervention for those things. So that's the area we're in. We also do wound healing. Um, and so that's all outcomes of the egg system. So we're going to go to the next slide here. Um, the way that, the, no, this isn't the right one, actually. I gave the wrong slide. Um, we'll go back to the first slide and I'll describe what uh, the other slide was. Uh, the way that we actually, our system is based on a fish tank, if you can believe that. Oh, there it is here. Okay, so the entire, if we were to have uh, using a technology blood bu buzzword, the platform technology is a fish. And so first of all, if you think about a sustainable protein, um, it's actually our fish. So from that fish, we actually have the nutrient wastewater and we can either go to algae reactors, and it's from those algae that we have specific strains of algae that we tie to, say, the type 2 diabetes vision loss. We can also provide plants, and so in the system, um, we can do, whether it's just basic stuff like lettuce and everything that you'd find in a greenhouse, and so it's called aquaculture aquaponics. So that's a kind of a, not a new or innovative thing, but tying this together and balancing the two is what's very, very complicated. So on the right-hand side, you can see all of the type of products. So we can provide fish. We can provide, um, again, we can take the excess of the algae provided the chickens, and they can create the eggs. Um, and then we have algae bioactives. And then we have actual plant products. So the final example that I'm going to give is that we have three things. So that's fish, that's food, and we actually do something that's called fodder. So we actually look at growing what our food eats. So we had a great example of how hard a pound of beef is on our environment. So we've been working in Manitoba with a dairy farmer, and so two of our tanks can actually provide enough uh, dairy fodder to provide food for 200 dairy cows. So normally they would they crop 1,000 acres. Now they can use that acreage to grow other valuable crops, and we actually, in an indoor kind of greenhouse, if you will, grow the barley fodder that then increases the milk production. Um, actually, we're working with them to add some algae into it to change the amino, gr amino acid group so that milk is more healthy, and that's the type of research we're doing there. So either directly or indirectly, our food production systems are trying to work with farmers to become a very more sustainable kind of farm, or directly in situ, like in a community, develop a food production facility that is tailored to their health outcomes. So that's kind of how the system works, and that's um, all I got. Good afternoon, and thank you to everyone who is attending this session. 
Uh, as you are all waiting with bated breath to hear about pond scum, um, I'm going to talk to you today about one way in which technology, in combination with wetlands, can be used to keep our poultry industry safe from avian flu. So, oh, do I have a pointer? There we go. So most of us have heard about avian flu in the news, but why is it important to us in terms of food security? Well, avian influenza is a viral disease with impacts on wildlife, on humans, and on domestic animals, in particular poultry. In fact, avian influenza's impact on the security of poultry products is multifaceted and can be seen through the economy, through trade, and through product availability. For instance, as many of you know, in 2014-2015, the poultry industry experienced a global outbreak of the disease. In the US alone, this outbreak caused the euthanasia of 48 million poultry birds. It resulted in international trade restrictions and is estimated to have cost $3.3 billion in economic losses. So the impact of this virus is real and it can be devastating. Now an important consideration in the impact of avian flu is that it is actually a bit of what we call a sloppy virus, meaning that when it duplicates itself, it often does so imperfectly. This leads to having multiple forms of the virus floating around at any one time. These different uh, forms of the virus are identified by numbered surface proteins. I'm just gonna get geeky here for a second, specifically neuraminidase and hemagglutinin which is where we actually get the names that we actually recognize, like H5N1. And this is important because certain forms of the virus have an increased risk for causing disease in poultry, specifically those with H5 or H7 genes. This variation in risk is between these different viruses is part of what makes the pr predicting the year-to-year -year risk in um, of this disease so tricky to, to understand. Now, although the risk of avian flu is distributed globally, we do have personal experience of the disease right here at home in BC. The Fraser Valley is a dense poultry production region and it is at risk for AI outbreaks. In fact, the valley has seen multiple outbreaks since 2004, and that includes that 2014-2015 global outbreak that I was talking about. And what I really want to highlight here is that we did have a, a passive surveillance system in place and it was unable to detect that virus before the outbreak. This means that our poultry industry did not get an early warning of the dangers that it faced that season. Now, talking about early detection, the key to early detection of avian influenza lies in the fact that these viruses naturally circulate in wild ducks and it usually doesn't cause death or disease. Therefore, the migration of these ducks allows for the worldwide movement of these viruses, as well as allowing for increased recombination of these viruses into the different forms that I mentioned earlier. This also tells us that the surveillance of avian flu is best done by testing wild ducks. However, as I'm sure you can all imagine, going out and catching ducks one by one is a little bit tricky which makes testing of individual ducks a very labor-intensive form of surveillance. And as this one-by-one -one technique is used in our current national surveillance program, it also explains why our current wild bird AI detection rate is only about 1%. That means that 99 out of 100 samples tested do not detect avian flu. Additionally, although this current surveillance is based on this uh, individual duck testing, we actually really don't care if Joe Duck rather than Jim Duck is carrying the virus or not. What we really want to know is if from all of the birds flying around the region, are there any dangerous viruses circulating that put our regional poultry industry at risk? So this tells us that we really need a new approach to surveillance that lets us better predict risk. So the background is, as wild ducks excrete virus in their feces, and as ducks like to congregate and defecate on wetlands, mud from those wetlands may well contain lots of feces with lots of viruses from lots of different birds. 
So what our study wanted to see was if we could make use of Mother Nature's outhouse to perform surveillance of avian flu in wild birds. To do this, we collected mud samples from the wetlands across the Fraser Valley, actually during that 2014-2015 outbreak. We then subjected the mud to molecular analysis to see if we could uh, detect AI and determine if this technology could be used to assess the level of risk to poultry farms in the Fraser Valley. Now, of course, there is a downside to testing wetland mud, and that is that there is a lot of organic material in there. So technically, this makes it very hard to pick out which genetic material specifically belongs to avian flu rather than to, say, plants or bacteria, which obviously we also find in wetlands. Our solution was to use two molecular technologies together. And how we use these technologies is similar to uh, using a weather forecast to determine your chances of getting wet today. So the first technology that we use is a tool called PCR, which lets us determine the presence or absence of avian flu. So this is like pulling out your phone and looking at your weather app and seeing an icon for sunshine or for raindrops. However, because of that variation in risk between different forms of the virus that I mentioned earlier, this step is n uh, alone is not enough. We need to go to a second step, uh, which is called targeted genomic sequencing, which essentially pulls the avian influenza out of that organic stew and tells us what type of virus is present. So if you're to look at your weather app, this is essentially like reading the amount of rain predicted. If the forecast predicts less than one mil of rain, I'm okay with running out to my car in my t-shirt. But if the forecast predicts over 50 mils of rain, I'm not leaving home without my umbrella. This dual technology system allows us to make efficient use of our surveillance dollars because we only reserve that second intensive step for those samples that we already know contain the virus. Critically, it also lets us determine if any of those risky H5 or H7 viruses are found in our samples. And it is this information that the poultry industry can use to understand what level of biosecurity protection they need against avian flu. So do they, are they okay with a light rain jacket or do they need to pull out the snowsuit? So back to our study, what did we find? Well, it turns out we were able to find avian influenza in mud samples taken during that outbreak. And actually, we found quite a bit of it. Now, this included multiple forms of the virus, which isn't surprising, but most significant was that we did detect that year's outbreak virus. And as you can see from the wide distribution of the red symbols on the map there, that outbreak virus was actually spread all across the Fraser Valley. Now, remember that this was the virus that our current surveillance system was not able to detect ahead of the outbreak. So our study gives us a couple of very important conclusions. First of all, this means that the risk of these dangerous avian flu viruses is spread across the whole Fraser Valley and is not specific to one or two farms next to a certain wetland. Secondly, it means that we could have detected this high-risk virus ahead of the outbreak if we had been using this wetland surveillance system. So where do we go from here? The value added part, as Ricky mentioned earlier. BC's poultry industry has responded to the recent outbreak and is trying to stay ahead of the curve. They've instigated a stoplight system for avian flu alert status, which is similar to the idea of homeland security alert status, which I'm sure we're all pretty familiar with. So the idea that Green is a lower alert status and red is high alert for the potential risk of avian flu. Our new wetland surveillance system gives us an assessment of the level of risk of the avian flu, which will feed then into the stoplight system. This then allows the poultry industry to maintain appropriate biosecurity protocols and prevents fatigue from overuse of this high alert status. And finally, Given the global distribution of the disease and the reliance on traditional surveillance methods, BC has the potential to become a world leader in the innovation of avian flu surveillance and in uh, our food security for our poultry products. Thank you all very much for your time and to all the great people and organizations that helped make this possible.
Well, it's a pleasure to, uh, to be here. And uh, pond scum, who knew? Who knew? Uh, if you went for a job interview at PayPal, uh, Peter Thiel would probably ask you this question, or years ago he would have. What important truth do very few people agree with you on? That's a really good question. And uh, as, as, as Dave Smarden threw the gauntlet down, I really have to pick it up and say, Malthus was wrong. Now, for any of you who know about, uh, go back a couple of hundred years, and Thomas Malthus said, I've been thinking, and there's this unusual thing about agriculture. Agriculture, the ability to grow food, increases arithmetically. But a population, humans with our rich and varied libido, we tend to go up logarithmically. So we have a problem, people. And uh, this was the idea. Now, if we move forward to the Neo-Malthus uh, uh, advocates, etc., you can add to that list, we're not only going to die of starvation, we're going to die of disease, and we're going to die of in, 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 uh, uh, environmental degradation. And so I'd like to start by saying, I'm standing here today saying Malthus was wrong, and let's all uh, move forward. Uh, I'm more of a, uh, a Boserup fan myself. If you take a look, I don't know, do I have a pointer? I do have a pointer. If you take a look at population, you can see that it's going up dramatically, and that's not going to change for a while. And uh, if you believe Dave's numbers, we're going to be pushing up uh, 9 billion plus. And uh, if you believe Malthus, there's something called a catastrophe coming down the road, or the Malthus trap, as it's often known. However, many people, including myself and many in this room, are actually making that happen in a different way. We believe in the Bosserup idea that necessity is the mother of invention. You have more hungry people, let's make more food. And it's all about technology, and that's what transformative agriculture is all about. How are we going to feed those people? How are we going to generate uh, a, a, a s solutions, hopefully from agriculture, for treating diseases and, and other things? Transformation agriculture is really needed. So my talk today is really broken down into four little parts. The first part talks about, well, how did we get this far? Malthus said in 1700, when the world's uh, population was about a billion globally, we're in trouble, people. Well, we've made it this far. How did we do that? And I'll give you one example about how nitrogen started with a little fish and moved onward from there. I think I'd then like to talk about two ideas about how agriculture can be used to treat disease. And we're using uh, uh, Defiris's uh, ZMAP Ebola treatment as an idea how agriculture can be used in a novel way to address some of these uh, very uh, significant world challenges. Uh, death by environmental degradation. Many of us are probably wearing nylon or uh, polyester, well, hopefully not polyester, but nylon, and et cetera. And is there a way that agriculture can produce things other than silk, other than wool, other than cashmere, et cetera, and have those to be very high performance materials. And that'll take you back about 15 years for some of the work we did at Nexia Biotechnologies on harnessing the protein synthetic capability of the, uh, of the lactational system to produce very high end properties, uh, spider silk. And lastly, who's the who, what, why, where, when of, well, if this is uh, all this wonderful technology, why isn't it coming forward? What are the challenges? What are the opportunities? What are we facing today for all those bright, shining faces that are running, literally running through the hallway to their next VC meeting to, to grab that Series A funding? The future is bright. Technology is there. But there are challenges that we have to address. And so I'd like to say a few words about that at the end of my, uh, end of my point. Avoiding the Malthusian trap. Where did we get the food from? Well, it started First Nations had wonderful ideas. And the, if we come to the new world and we say we want to plant a corn seed. Well, if you planted that corn seed just in the ground, after a while the ground doesn't work anymore. And First Nations people figured this out thousands of years ago. However, if you took a fish, you had enough fish to eat. There was fish swimming. If you took the fish and put it with your corn, voila, something happened. And what happened was the corn grew better. The land wasn't burned out. And population continued to buzz along around a billion. Eventually, though, it was harder and harder to grow large fields of corn by putting a little fish next to it. Fortunately, around the, uh, around the first part of the 1800s, somebody found a new source. The new source came about because of a blue-footed Peruvian booby. This little bird loves fish. Hey, 
what a lovely continuity here, eats fish by the ton, and then promptly goes on a little island and drops a load. It's very, very dry there. Some places haven't had seen rain in, in, in recorded history. And as a result, you get literally mountains of bird dung. And in fact, this dried up and was recognized as a resource. And people harvested it, put it in bags, and sent it to Western Europe, sent it to the, the, the rice paddies of Asia, and we were able to increase production. But as you can see, even the largest bird pile, a bird dung pile, will eventually be consumed, and that's what happened. So it went away. So there was no more fish we could put with the, with the corn, and the Peruvian bird guano deposits were quickly exhausted, and they were considerable, 600,000 tons a year. That's a lot of bird poop. But there was another technological solution. I'm using these examples to say that when there's a necessity, scientists like you and the people that you're training will come forward and make a solution. Obviously, you all know the story about Fritz Haber and Carl Bosch, who said, the answer is right in front of you. It's all right here. 70% of what you breathe is nitrogen. All you have to do is fix it so plants can use it. Some plants, of course, can fix nitrogen, but most can't. And as a result, all you had to do was to be able to take hydrogen, nitrogen, put it together, form ammonium nitrate and a variety of other types of ammonium fertilizers, and problem solved. And this was a huge idea. And it went on to make BASF and, and a number of other companies a great deal of money over the years. Today, fast forward. We've gone from 1700 to today. We need a lot of nitrogen. If we think about it, 460 million tons of nitrogen fertilizers used. That's what's allowed us to get this far. And if you don't believe me, just look inward. 80% of the nitrogen that's in your body today was originally fixed by the Haber-Bosch process. So you are literally what you eat. And it all started with that process. However, like most technologies, there's always controversy. And the controversy around this was, yes, this, this process makes wonderful nitrogen fertilizer. It also makes explosives. And the world was reeling from the, sec or the First World War when the Nobel Prize was, was given to Haber. And so uh, you, can always, you can see what's going to happen there. So the net effect of all of this, just to give you an idea that the food truck is on the way, um, is the fact that the world's population has gone along. We put fish with the seed, then we put guano with the seed, then we put nitrogen fertilizer with the seed, and uh, this number continues to go up dramatically. And you can see it over here on a, a more expanded scale. The world's population added a couple of billion, but the ability to produce grain went up even faster. And so we're, so far, we're all right. But if you actually take a close look at this, population, you'll see there's a couple of big dips. The plague, the Black Plague, hit in 1300. And you can see even on this expanded scale where you're talking about billions of people, uh, disease has impacted humans for quite some time in a very significant way. So we're fine on food, at least for the time being, as long as the wonderful innovations, some of which you've heard today, uh, will be brought forward and commercialized. Food is in good shape. But what about disease? What about environmental degradation? What can we do there using agriculture and transformative ideas? Well, let's take a disease that probably is fresh in many people's minds, and that's the Ebola outbreak that happened in, in 2014 and 2015. Most of you before that time probably didn't know much about Ebola. It was a neglected tropical disease of Central Africa, the DRC, Congo, Uganda. And you can see by the size of these arrows, this was taken in the middle of 2014 when the epidemic or the pandemic was just starting to get going. Uh, you can see there was a number of small outbreaks. The total aggregate number is less than 1,000 people. So when I say neglected tropical disease, I mean it. Six outbreaks, 1,000 patients net? Uh, we weren't too concerned about that. They were. We weren't necessarily because we always think of ourselves. Is this going to get me? And unless you travel to that part of Africa, the answer then was probably not. The reason Defiris was working on it was because the same virus that Mother Nature has so carefully created uh, had been weaponized by a number of adversarial nations, and so our military-industrial complex was quite interested in coming up with a medical countermeasure to this disease. 
It wasn't a public health agency concern at the time, particularly, but it became one in 2014. It became one when this uh, disease that was typically in very rural areas in Central Africa moved to the heavy urban, uh, urban areas of West Africa. And what happened there, uh, everybody has seen that slide before. We saw a rather dramatic rise from the middle to the end of the year and then ongoing. This is only in uh, September, so there were 9,000 cases. This went well beyond that, well out through the top of the room, if you will, to 25,000 or more cases. And so this represented a very significant challenge. It was in urban areas, and uh, this particular disease was only a, a six or eight hour flight from most places in the world. And so if this is a place for transformative agriculture, uh, let's take a look and see what's going to happen with regard to that. Well, just to give you a little idea about the little nasty guy here, this is a filovirus, uh, Zaire Ebola. There's a couple of things that you need to know. First of all, it is quite aggressive once it gets into your body. It's not particularly infectious. And so that if I had the disease and, and, and all of you were, I was talking to you, the chance of you contracting it is actually quite small. But once one or two virions get in your body, then uh, some, some nasty things happen. This virus grows very, very quickly. And uh, what happens then is untreated, uh, this hemorrhagic fever virus would, uh, uh, in all, in all uh, probability, do some nasty things to your body and probably kill you. It's also a uh, RNA virus. And so, uh, as you know about a number of different viruses, these mutate quite quickly. So it's very, very difficult to make a, a vaccine to. And so what one needs to do is create something that, uh, uh, that can be made that would treat an individual who has this particular disease. Uh, the last thing I'll tell you about is how does Ebola shake hands with the outside world? And it happens through these little tiny glycoproteins. This is coating on the outside of the virus, and this is uh, something that we decided that we would like to target. Now, when I say we, this is a, this is a, a team sport. And so these viruses came, or these uh, antibodies, these GP-specific Ebola antibodies came from a number of, of, of very significant programs. Um, Public Health Agency of Canada and Winnipeg have been working on several of these for many years, and their pioneering efforts uh, uh, need to be recognized. Similarly, south of the border, uh, the U.S. Army, USAMRID, was also dealing with this threat again from the, uh, the bioweapons idea. And so the concept was RNA virus, this thing's mutating like crazy. The only way to do it is to have a variety of different epitopes. So if you went right, I've got you. If you went left, I've got you. If you went up, I've got you. And so using the tripartite of the 2G4, 4G7, and 13C6, we've been able to avoid, uh, at least up to this point, escape mutants. And this has proven to be a highly effective treatment for ongoing Ebola infection, uh, both in, in, in animals and, unfortunately, we also found out uh, in humans. And so what that really happens then is the antibodies will, will find the Ebola virus, they decorate it, and that really targets the virus for uh, uh, suppression and elimination by the immune system. This virus actually is really quite stealthy, so you, you normally your immune system would not respond to this at all. So what's the problem? Why can't the first world just make this and dump it into Africa? The problem is cost. If, if we look at the number of the, the West uh, African nations, they spend less than a dollar a year on public health, a dollar a year. So quite clearly, we needed a system that does uh, low cost very well, and agriculture is, a, is an example that can do that. And uh, this is a tobacco plant, and uh, the idea would be is to say, well, tobacco plants grow well, we know how to work with them, we know how to genetically modify them, and generally people don't eat them. Some people do, but, you know, that's their, that's their issue. And so basically what happens is leaves, plants, interact through the stomata. They breathe, opposite to us. They take in CO2, dump oxygen, and thank goodness they do, otherwise we'd all die because we wouldn't be able to have a source of oxygen in the planet. And, and what we've done basically is to take the, the diff, three different uh, gene sequences with genetic control elements, uh, place them into agrobacterium, place the, the tobacco plants, I don't know if any of you have ever seen this, into this very large vacuum, pull a vacuum, the plant goes, <gasps> opens up, you spray in your agrobacterium, then you pop the vacuum to back to ambient. <laughs> plant takes in the agrobacterium, 14 days later, this plant is producing large numbers of human proteins. 
the fact that this tobacco was very particular tobacco that had been modified prior to avoid the glycosylation problems that we've seen in some plant-based uh, uh, pharmaceuticals that have been overcome. So there's no, the glycosylation profiles on these antibodies are, are really human. So the, what we were able to do then is uh, grow large amounts of tobacco, uh, not as large as much as we'd like, and this, re this represents one of the regulatory challenges that we faced. Growing tobacco is easy. We all, well, we used to, maybe some people still smoke it, but it was grown in huge amounts. So we went to one of the world's largest grower at Reynolds, and uh, we worked with them inside a greenhouse. Containment is a regulatory issue. Containment represented a significant barrier for us because we couldn't deal with the big. We'll talk about this later on when I get to the end, about agriculture does best when it goes big. And this runs counter to containment and a variety of other issues that are necessary. And so this represents a challenge. So you need a lot of tobacco, and we had uh, acres of tobacco. And uh, after that, you take the plants, you grind them up. The front end produces a green material. The back end looks like traditional monoclonal antibody production, and uh, you're able to produce this particular material. Uh, the drug then uh, was, is now available on expanded use protocol around the world. And uh, this was a particularly uh, a poignant moment for me when Ginetta McCauley traveled from Sierra Leone to come and visit us uh, in Toronto and then went on to Winnipeg. Uh, we often think of science as something that is out there. Science is something you do, but you don't really live. And uh, when I saw this gracious woman come in, coming into our offices in Toronto with her story, and her story was both a sad one and a happy one. Um, she lost several family members to the Ebola infection. Uh, her husband, um, her son, the doctor who was attending them all, and uh, the nurse that was attending them all, they all perished. She didn't. Um, she was able to get the Ebola drug in time. Uh, it arrived as, as she was uh, very deep into her infection. And, uh, and she survived. So uh, this is the human face that uh, many of us would like to see about you work so hard for so long and you're always wondering if it makes a difference. And when you actually see that happening, it's, uh, it's uh, something you don't forget. Now, changing uh, course a little bit differently then, we've been talking about pl uh, plants a lot. What about animals? I had to throw in an example of how transformative agriculture could happen in animals. And a really nice animal is dairy. Dairy animals have been around for a long time. If you take a look up here, since Egyptian times and even before that, we've milked cows, goats, sheep, um, because milk is a near-perfect food. We all started life that way. Do you remember when you were on that liquid diet? Probably not. But if you did, uh, you'd realize that you were able to do very, very well. Uh, and it's one of the defining features of mammals that uh, we like milk. Um, ruminants were domesticated because they can take plant-derived material like cellulose, or rather they're, they're very sophisticated stomachs, and turn that into very high quality protein, lipids, and, the, and this wonderful food. We know it as milk, we know it as the dairy, dairy industry. And they do this extremely well. If I was ever trapped on a, des a desert island, and I only had one animal to have with me, I'd have a goat with me. Because the goat can eat the grass. Don't eat the goat. Let the goat eat the grass, and then milk the goat. Well, why do you do that? Why do we do that? We do that, and the reason the dairy industry exists today is because dairy ruminants do this phenomenally well. You don't believe me? Ask my gold, the current record holder in North America. You can tell she's from the United States of America because it's expressed in pounds. I think there's a few countries in the world that, use, that don't use the metric system, a couple in Africa and the United States. When they joined on, the rest of us, it's about 35, 38,000 uh, kilos of milk in 365 days. That's pretty impressive. That's really impressive, especially when you consider that she produced 2,000 pounds of protein. And that protein was easily collected from that animal. You just milk her. It's purely sanitary. Sanit it is a sanitary process. And it's, uh, it's something that is, is very, very efficient. And lots of fat, too. And so we, we milk these animals two or three times a day, and it's a great system. So why not do something more with it? Let's do something more with these animals to use this hugely protein synthetic capability. But what animal are we going to use? 
we thought about mice. They're, they're easy to genetically modify, but they don't make a lot of milk. There aren't many mouse dairies, and the equipment's hard to find. <laughs> On the other end is whales. Now, there's a lactational species. Whales produce about five to 600 liters of milk every day. They're wonderful. They feed themselves. Unfortunately, they're hard to get to come back to get milk them every day. So we chose an animal in the middle, which was a dairy goat. Wonderfully uh, uh, productive, and uh, the genome was available to us. And from that point of view, then, we want to come back. Before I leave this, though, I want you to feel good about agriculture. People walk in the hallways with a little bit of swagger from the semiconductor industry. Well, yeah, we did that. We put that in your phone. Well, you can say, yeah, I'm in the agriculture business, and, and our, our industry is about the same size as yours. So give milk some credit. We're about the same size as industry. We're around $106 billion in North America. The semiconductor industry is about 120 or so. We don't spend much money on R&D. They spend 50, 50, I forget, 10 or $20 billion a year in order to maintain that type of, uh, of, of ability. We spend a fraction of that. Although when I was doing research back at McGill, I wish we had to spend more money on R&D. So how do you harness the protein synthetic capability of the mammary gland? Well, you need two things. First, a gene of interest, and this gets to the why. Why are you doing this? Why do you need these particular proteins? Structural proteins like spider silk or human collagen, or functional proteins like tissue plasminogen activator, the world's best clot buster, or butyrol cholinesterase, BCHE. BCHE was another product that we produced during this time. Uh, it was used to treat uh, nerve agent intoxication or cocaine addiction. Uh, so you need a gene of interest. Uh, we chose spider silk in this particular example. The second thing you need is control. Everybody wants control. The regulators insist on control, reasonably, and I think you need to have it. And fortunately, gene expression in the mammary gland is under exquisite control. Ask any man in the room, how's your lactation going? <laughs> no one's worried about it, right? You're not worried about it because the genes have been fully methylated in your, in your bodies. Your casein genes, gentlemen, will never be turned on in your lifetime. And, and your son's lifetime, and your son's son's lifetime. Only in your daughters, only within the mammary gland, and only with a very particular type of hormonal milieu will those genes turn on in the mammary gland. No other tissue in the body, and then go away. So you need two things. You need uh, a gene of interest, that'll eventually become the protein, or the protein in your product, and you need a way of controlling it. Well, the gene of interest, we thought spider silk. Now, that's a great idea. We hear a lot of things about Kevlar. We hear a lot of things about Dyneema, ultra-high molecular weight polyethylenes. And these are truly impressive petroleum-based products that are purchased by the billions of pounds. Uh, Kevlar, for example, anyone interested in environmental degradation, is, is spun out of boiling 100% sulfuric acid. Its feedstock is petroleum. Ah, that's a good product, and if you needed to make a ballistic vest, maybe it's worthwhile. But in the long run, these types of high-performance materials uh, are a bit of a, uh, a lost proposition. So is there a solution? Is there a different way of doing this? And the answer is yes, there is. Spider silk. And spiders make a variety, this particular spider that's available in your backyard, all this wonderful technology going on right in your backyard, at least in your backyard here in BC, in Ontario, it's still snowing. Uh, they make dragline silk, which is, uh, has mechanical properties that are truly impressive. They dwarf the mechanical properties of Kevlar or any other man-made filament in, in sense of their, their uh, toughness, tensile strength, their biodegradability and flexibility and ultralight fiber. So this seems like something that would really be worthwhile. If you're thinking more about lycra, well, the Archimedes spiral is made up of a different type of silk called viscid silk, which is uh, very, very flexible, and a combination of the two of them. That has evolved over around 400 million years. The spider took a long time to get it right, but uh, she really did get it right. And so uh, the idea is using the dragline silk to, to move forward. Now, many of you are probably sitting there saying, wait a minute. If you can milk a goat, why can't you silk a spider? We have the sericultural industry, and if I was wearing a tie, they told me not to wear a tie, we're in Vancouver after all, but if I was to wear a tie, and that tie was made out of silk, where did it come from? Sericulture, right? Why can't we, we did it there, why can't we do it with spiders? Well, some people did, there's in fact established patents 
uh, in Canada and the United States for spider silk spinning machines. Don't invest. <laughs> it's not a good investment. Uh, you take the spider, gingerly put them down, and then silk them. You can get a fair amount of material, but it's really a, a bit of an economic dead end. And so uh, it's not a, not a good way to go. And more importantly, unlike the gregarious little vegetarian silkworm, spiders are territorial carnivores. So if you filled this room with spiders and you came back in a week, there'd be one big spider left. She would have killed all the rest of them. So we move on. So there's got to be a better way. And the, uh, the, the better way then was to use a casein promoter connected to an Aphelius clavipes uh, silk gene for the, for the, the uh, uh, dragline silk. And then using technology originally, uh, little willow here was produced uh, by adding one highly characterized spider silk gene through um, microinjection technique. Uh, this is a single-celled goat egg to which a, a few copies of the gene was inserted into her genome. Uh, that egg then became willow, and when willow uh, matured, got pregnant, and started to produce material in, in her milk, or started to produce milk, the casein gene turned on, and spider silk protein was made, could be easily extracted from the, uh, from the milk. Um, for other technologies that uh, we talked, Ricky and I were talking about unintended consequences. One of the unintended consequences was microinjection is really inefficient. Only about 5% of the, of the eggs will actually uh, turn out to make transgenic animals. And so we wanted to increase the, increase the efficiency of doing that. And so we ended up using uh, a variety of nucleation techniques uh, that the world knows as cloning. So uh, it's ironic that we did all of this really interesting work, but Nexia Biotechnologies is probably known best for the first group in the world to clone a goat. Uh, although that cloning was actually technology to allow us to increase the efficiency of gene introduction. The net effect then is if we take the spider over here, a 400 million year evolution, she got it right. She eats bugs, it's renewable. She spins silk right here in this room no boiling sulfuric acid, and she uses the feedstock that you have in your hair, amino acids. It's simple. But what's the magic about it is that when she drag lines off the silk, something, uh, a self-assembling nanoprocess occurs, and a beautiful beta-pleated sheet structure forms that's completely waterproof and very high tensile strength properties. Uh, this material is, is truly impressive. At its strength properties have allowed us to be receive funding from the United States military and the Canadian military to generate uh, ballistic vests, better soft body armor that was more flexible and more fashionable. Uh, and you wouldn't have the typical holes that you see in ballistic vests. The reason that there's, it's a vest and not a tunic is because Kevlar is extremely inflexible. And so you'd walk like this, and so you cut a hole which is not so good sometimes for your protection. Other uses for this silk in, in, includes very fine ophthalmic sutures uh, that could be used, or synthetic ligaments or tendons, or even for the semiconductor area to produce ultra-thin wires. The smallest wire we ever spun was about 20 nanometers. We spun it with carbon nanotubes to make it conductive, and you could spin this at a super fine uh, level. Uh, on, the, on the other side uh, was about a seven-year program I can feel the sound of distant thunder. Uh, uh, on the other side is uh, a project that took about six years and about $100 million, and uh, the goats only got half away. They'd produce the silk. You'd milk the goats. They never, we could never get them to spin it, although we never wanted them to, really. Uh, so we harvested the milk, and then we spun the material. Uh, it turned out to be quite a challenge to, uh, to be able to do that, uh, but you're, we were able to produce material uh, of very high tensile properties. So, turning to the challenges, we're in the home stretch. Um, you're like little spiders. All of us are little spiders. We've got novel products. We've got a great idea. Like these two little spiders, if you can't read uh, across the bottom, it says, if we can pull this off, we're going to live like kings. I think that's how a lot of people that are high-tech developers whether it's agriculture or others are thinking about. They've worked long and hard to develop their technology. People have invested their hard-earned money, and they'd like to see a return. What are the barriers and challenges to these little spiders? Who owns that slide? Who regulates that slide? Is that slide GMP? We don't know. So let's talk about them. I'd like to talk about three different issues. The first one is a significant one, and it's one that sort of happened, sort of crept up on us. It's actually who's paying 
for the R&D and who's doing it. And that's extremely important, has a lot of ramifications. The second thing is, is why are we doing this? The number one question I receive for all of these different products over the years is people would say, why are you doing this? And, and so we need to do a better, better job on the cost-benefit analysis of some of these high-end products. And lastly, regulatory complexity, the risk, and the duration. So I'll finish with these three slides. The first one talks about who's paying. And who's paying has changed. And it's been uh, since about the mid-60s. Uh, if we take a look at, at the entire pie, and this is the 80 or 90 percent of the pie, we can see that the green line, which represents government funding, has been falling steadily in, 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 in corrected, dollar corrected numbers over the years. And is now, it used to be up in the 65 to 70 area, and now it's down around 30 percent of all the R&D done in North America. If we look at what's happening in industry, we see almost the reciprocal trend. Other, I'm not sure who other is, if anyone could let me know who the other is, uh, uh, please, uh, please do so, because I'm not sure who they are. But we've seen a big difference between these two. And you say, well, if I get money from industry, I get it from the government, what's the big deal? Well, government research, government-funded research, tends to be much more open. It tends to be done on a very careful, long-term basis, and it's done for the public good. What's happening in industry? In industry, you could take a jaded view. The one jaded view would be from the late Michael Crichton, who says the commercialization of molecular biology is the most stunning ethical event in the history of science. That could be true. Life sciences is, is actually getting at the heart of things when we deal with the genome and a, a wide variety of other things that actually talk to us about what it means to be human. And the, uh, the last line, I think, is also significant. It's done in secret, it's done in haste, and it's done for profit. And so we could, what, what Crichton is saying is, back 25 years ago, is this is an industry that has to be regulated. We have to make sure that it's more open. We have to make sure that it's, it's done on a reasonable timeline. The profit motive will always be there, but we have to be able to sure things are balanced. S second thing is, with regard to cost-benefit, what are your costs? People think dollars is your only currency, but we all know there's many more. Risks that are known and risks that are unknown. And loss of choice represents a significant idea that we all have to talk about when we're bringing these transformational te technologies forward. We have to be sure that we're able to address these types of costs. It's more than money. Getting something cheap isn't the necessarily the only thing. Another thing is the benefit. We need to showcase why it benefits the consumers. So I chose two different examples. One example is the cost is fairly moderate with regard to some of these items, but the benefit is large, and that's novel medicines. Who among you with a life-threatening infection would not take, that, in, take that, that drug if it were made in life sciences or, or biotechnology that offended you? Probably very few of us. And we see this all the time. We saw it initially with grinding up pig pancre... What's the plural of pancreas? Pancreae. Pancreae? Multiple pig pancreases. And a uh, uh, wonderful Canadian success story. We, we were able to inject that into our bodies and live. Recombinant insulin is the same. On the other side, there's been lots of things about novel food. Here, the cost in terms of, of, of risks, unknown risks, uh, loss of choice, et cetera, are significant. And so what happens is, is that these represent a very wide uh, 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 continuum of cost-benefit analysis. Then there are the ones in the middle, spider silk. If spider silk's using to repair your ACL so you can get back out there and run at 7 o'clock in the morning in this beautiful weather, then you think that's all good. If that spider silk instead is going over here and used to make a, a high-end miniskirt for the, for the Paris Fashion Week, eh, it may not be something that you really buy into. So it's really the application of these technologies. Similarly, rice. If rice is food and genetically modified, a lot of people have a problem with it. If it becomes a nutraceutical and can spare millions of children and others around the world because it's actually over on this side, then people think about it a little bit differently. Uh, the third point we'll talk about complexity. And I know we have regulators in a room, and God bless them that they're here because they want to know about what's happening. They're part of the puzzle. They're part of the solution alongside with us. And so what do we need? Agriculture does, does well, it does best when we go big. These are the challenges we had. 
when, when we had to contain our goats and perimeter fences that looked like a stole egg, that re represented a real challenge to get big and effective. When, when, same thing with the tobacco. The second aspect is, is how do we deal with some of the irrational thoughts that happen in the public? Fear, anxiety, evidence-based legislation that we benefit from in Canada is, 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 is largely or often mitigated uh, with the fact that public loathing about new technology, don't, don't fool with my food, is, a, is an issue. And lastly, speed kills. And the one thing is, time and time again, we talk about technology developers, and they're saying, tell me yes. Tell me no that I can get into the marketplace. But one thing I don't want to hear is a slow maybe, because that's lethal. So I would argue that all sides of this conversation, whether it be from the regulators or from the people bringing these products to the regulators, uh, the, uh, that we need to be working together to address these things. Lastly, to finish up then, I'd say teams win. I've been very fortunate over my professional life to be involved with a number of very creative men and women that have allowed me to take my vision forward to allow us to explore the bounds and uh, push the boundaries of transformative agriculture so that we can see what really is possible, that, these, that the type of Malthusian traps can be avoided if we all work together. And I think that's really the message. It comes down to people, people like you, that are willing to spend their lifetime to ensure that we don't fall into the Malthusian trap. Thank you. The BC Ministry of Agriculture, in partner partnership with the BC Innovation Council, recently hosted the first ever AgriTech Innovation Challenge. I had the pleasure of working with the innovators that were involved in the process, and it certainly was an excellent example of innovation exchange. Innovation exchange is where the challenges of larger organizations, in this case the agricultural sector, is matched with innovative solutions from BC tech companies. It's a win-win situation. The sector gets to try a new solution to solve a challenge, and the tech company expands their customer base or maybe even enters a new market. The Agritech Challenge took four thematic areas from the BC agricultural sector and presented them at a discovery day which was held in Kelowna this past November as a kickoff to the Minister's Conference on the Food Supply Security. This was in recognition of the fact that we need technology and innovation to ensure our industry remains competitive, resilient, and able to provide a secure food supply. We developed our four challenge theme areas through consultation with industry and the Ministry of Agriculture's industry specialists. The four areas where we were specifically seeking innovations included berry competitiveness, pest management, greenhouse efficiency, and nutrient management. After the November Discovery Day, we received letters of interest from innovators who had solutions to these challenges. It's my pleasure today to be able to welcome the Honorable Amrick Verk, who will announce our winners. Is the minister here? Oh, here we are. Well, good afternoon. It's always a, a pleasure to be here. Ken Hardy, you are here. We were looking for you. <laughs> oh, <laughs> well, we, we've got uh, MP Ken Hardy here as well. Folks, so this is a partnership. It's a partnership between uh, the government of British Columbia and, and the government of Canada in getting these things done. Let's talk tech a little bit. Uh, uh, Mike, thank you very much for the introduction. Let's, BC's agricultural area has gone from two and a half billion, a lot of, that's a lot of zeros, to 13 billion in the last five years alone. And I'm gonna take full credit for that because of the tech space, <laughs> no. But it's been incredible growth in the last five years and, and tech is indeed the reason. And I, I remember when we opened up the Agrotech Accelerator um, uh, in the Valley, there was a sign in the back. And the sign said technology and future thinking will feed the world. Think about that, technology and future thinking will feed the world. And, 
And, and that's exactly what's happened. When you can go from a two and a half billion dollar uh, sector growth to 13 billion in five years, that's absolutely incredible. And, and I, I, I don't see where the end point is. I don't see an end point at all when, when we can grow our economy and grow our, our, our agricultural area. It's new ideas that you bring forward. Uh, my role is small, is, is how I can support it, I can have the environment that's stable for you to do that work and, and supporting technology is a way to do so. So the applications in the Innovation Challenge showcase, uh, showcase a diversity of talent in, in BC's tech community and, and how that expertise is changing how we do things in British Columbia. But it's not changing things that we do in British Columbia only. The fact that you're using technology, you're combining with agricultural and you're changing a life on the other side of the planet because think about the products, produce that you put, and sometimes maybe I don't even think it that way. It's gonna go on somebody's table 20,000 kilometers away. It's gonna nourish them. That nourishment's gonna take them to school. Can you imagine how you've changed lives? So I can't wait to hear more about who the winners are and I think we're gonna give them like a whole whack of money too, is that correct? 20,000 bucks to each one as well too. But even more so than that, it's, it's bragging rights. It's bragging rights that agriculture and technology came together. And think about it this way, and let's, let's remember that you are changing the world right from here for what you've done. So let's bring the awards going here. Ken, you're gonna join us to give the awards. I think the feds, you guys give half the money to this, didn't you? 60%. 60%, oh, hey, oh. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm going to back and forth here. Okay. Right? Yes, we're just going to welcome uh, Ken Hardy, Member of Parliament for Fleetwood Kells, to say a few opening remarks. Oh, thank you. Yes, I was wearing my blank look down there in the, in the cheap seats. Um, the, the money that uh, actually is, is going to these uh, entrepreneurs, so I'm not going to announce them because I think uh, we want to do that with kind of a drum roll effect. Uh, I, I think it's aptly described as seed money because you know you plant the seeds, something grows. And uh, it's amazing you know, just to stroll the halls here and see the innovation, the ideas flowing. The panel that was up here just before uh, this event started, I think that uh, every elected uh, person should have taken that in because they were telling the truth in terms of you know, taking the ideas. Canada punches above its weight in innovation, but it's that commercialization, it's getting it to market. So not only do the politicians have to hear that, but the bureaucrats as well. You know, and I, a lot of the work that I do, I'm on two standing committees in Parliament, but the one that's probably closest to your interest is uh, fisheries and oceans. And, uh, you know, we, we have to uh, realign things. We have to be more nimble. We have to be careful. You know, I have serious concerns about aquaculture. I, they need to come out and be a little bit more transparent to make everybody comfortable with what they're doing. But, you know, as, as Amrick said, you know, we are feeding the world and technology is going to help. So I'm pleased to be here on behalf of the Honorable Lawrence McCauley, who's the minister. National Research Council has been involved in this and they've been a good partner to a number of people up and down this corridor, in fact. Uh, they're a very, uh, very dynamic group and uh, uh, the purpose of our government is to make sure that they stay dynamic and that they're able to branch out and, and do the things that we need to do. In a country as big as Canada, though, one of the big uh, challenges is bandwidth. It's a big country, there's lots of opportunities, and there's only you know, so much money and so much energy to go around. But there's no better place to start than the agriculture sector because we plant the seed here, something grows, and it doesn't just grow to feed the world, it's gonna to grow to feed our economy and our future. Listening to the panel, there was a, it reminded me that just a couple of floors up, there's a group called Earthcast. And this may be of interest to people in the agriculture sector. They've developed a new digital radar that uses two bands, a high frequency band and a low frequency band. The high frequency band gets a really accurate digital picture of what's going on at ground level. The low frequency penetrates the ground. Think about that. So think about that as you hear the details of the winners of this challenge and see now how we can start to connect the dots and link innovations, one area to another, and the lift that that's going to really give to you know, the, the work that we're trying to do and the things that we're trying to accomplish as a sector and as a province and as a country. Um, and, and I have to say that uh, you know, my, my colleague uh, Amrick 
who, like me, has never been a farmer, but we're both outstanding in our fields. You've never heard that one before. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, the innovation that he represents, the innovation that our government represents in Ottawa, uh, is really focused on creating that new light on its feet type of economy, the value added economy that's already starting to position Canada well in the world. So thank you very much and I'll be looking forward to uh, hearing a little bit more about the winners. And if I could ask the minister to join us on stage for the presentation, that'd be great. Our first winner in the theme category of berry competitiveness is a company called Guavis. This company will use UAV technology to find alternatives to the existing methods that are currently used to deter pests on blueberry farms. Guavis will use their funding to deploy their pest bird deterrent service to early adopter berry growers. Please turn your attention to the screen to hear a little more about this project. My name is Milad Sakiani. I'm a co-founder for Guavas. We build a drone platform for farmers that helps them protect their crops in BC. Farmers are getting more than 10% of their crops destroyed by pest birds every season. We've developed a service that deploys a fleet of drones that actually protects their crops. We've combined some state-of-the-art technology such as drones, machine vision, and autonomous cloud control, and we've done this at a very low cost very effective and in a humane way that doesn't harm birds at all. So as I mentioned, we're protecting crops in BC, which means higher yields for farmers, higher quality fruits and vegetables that get delivered to the store, but also means more exports from BC across the globe. We've been working on this technology for a year and a half. We've prototyped it. We know it works. It's deterring birds. It's helping farmers. We are now in a position where we want to accelerate our commercialization of this product and get it out to farmers as fast as we can. Please, please join me in congratulating and welcome, welcoming to the stage Milad Sakiani from Guavas. The second category award we have to hand out is in the area of pest management. Our winner is someone who I've had the pleasure of mentoring and it's been wonderful to watch him go from an early stage idea and to someone who is going to be a BC technology success story. For the category of pest management, the winner is Saber Mirismaili of Ecoation. Saber will use his challenge funding to create opportunities for co-op students to use the technology within commercial greenhouse trials. Here's Saber's story on the screen. Please have a look. I'm Dr. Saber Mirismaili, founder and CEO of EIS CropSense. The technology is a result of 12 years of research and development to understand the state of the plant and the changes that the plants go through when they're under stress. The innovation relates to our specific way to understand the plant stress before the symptoms become visible. Greenhouse growers use close to 10% of their yield to pests and diseases each year. We can immediately eradicate that by helping them identify those factors soon enough to protect the crop. We can actually help growers everywhere to fight the impact of climate change that increase the, uh, the effect of pests and diseases by identifying those issues at the very earliest stages of development. Our technology captures more than 50,000 data points from each plant in a matter of a few seconds and allows us to unleash the power of mathematics and statistics and supercomputing to help the farmers. We are changing the way that we produce and protect our food. Please join me in congratulating 
Sabre mirrors Maley and Ecoation. Unfortunately, Sabre's wife, Miriam, had an unfortunate incident this afternoon, and they, at the last I heard, were at the hospital. So we're certainly hoping that things go well. Uh, and accepting the award on behalf of Ecoation is their chief revenue officer, Brian. Our next innovator is someone new to the agri-tech sector. Gordon Shank has an innovative product that he has used in other sectors like the defense sec sector. And when he found out about the challenge scenario for the BC greenhouse sector, he saw this as an opportunity for innovation immigration from his traditionally service sectors to agriculture. This is one of the best parts of the innovation exchange concept getting that cross-pollination. And we're excited that Gordon will be using his $20,000 to conduct trials in commercial greenhouses this season. Please watch the screen to learn a little bit more about his technology. I'm Gordon Shank. I'm the owner of GS Consulting. As the agricultural industry intensifies and a higher concentration of uh, growing in a smaller area, all the byproducts that are generated, they definitely add up. Our product is uh, creating a biodegradable string to replace the uh, synthetic and petrochemical derived strings that are currently used in the market. I am Jacob Kirkhoff, manager at Cali Farms. We have 20 acres of bell peppers producing about two and a half million kilos of peppers per year. At the end of the season, we need to throw away 3,000 kilometers of string to the landfill, and we want to be able to manage the waste stream of this farm sustainably. So we're looking for a biodegradable 20. There, there's a myth that the bio material should be more expensive or it should be inferior, you know, all, all kinds of stereotypes. And what's exciting is there are no compromises. It's not more expensive. The yarn itself is about double the strength of the incumbent nylon yarn that's being used and it's a biodegradable material. It's a win-win-win. Gordon, please come to the stage. Thank you. Gordon. Thanks again. Our final theme category is in the area of nutrient management and nutrient recovery. And I have had the privilege and the pleasure of working with this company for the last year and a half. They, are, they show a lot of promise. The winner of this year's award, this is a great story of a technology that was developed in the lab at UBC and has now crossed the chasm to a commercial entity. Please turn your attention to the screen to far, find out a little bit more about Boost Technologies. My name is Sergei Labanov. I'm the president of Boost Environmental Systems. For many farmers in BC, as well as across the country, manure application on a limited land basis is becoming an issue. Our technology allows them to reduce the amount of the manure and recover resources from it. This technology is a physical chemical process. It utilizes microwave irradiation to heat the manure and solubilize its solid portion. And it also allows them to extract uh, the nutrients uh, from this manure so that it does not create any problems in the environment. I'm Asha Srinivasan, Chief Technology Officer of uh, Boost Environmental Systems. The impact process can also be an excellent solution to the municipal wastewater treatment industry by transforming the conventional treatment system into a zero sludge system where the overall sludge yield will be extremely minimized. 
This technology can benefit to farmers in BC, across the country, and any other farmers in the world by making their manure handling more sustainable. Please, please welcome Dr. Sergei Lebanov. That concludes the Agritech Innovation Challenge Awards. Uh, please take some time, if you haven't already, and visit the greenhouse uh, where uh, a lot of our other technologies, exciting new technologies, are being represented. And don't hesitate to talk to someone from the Ministry of Agriculture, myself, or the BC Innovation Council about this concept of innovation exchange and how it might work for your organization. Thank you very much.